Today, in audiobooks for me, we are going to listen to The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie. This book is divided in three videos. This is part three. We hope you enjoy it. Chapter 10, The Arrest. To my extreme annoyance, Poirot was not in, and the old Belgian who answered my knock informed me that he believed he had gone to London. I was dumbfounded. What on earth could Poirot be doing in London? Was it a sudden decision on his part, or had he already made up his mind when he parted from me a few hours earlier? I retraced my steps to Styles in some annoyance. With Poirot away, I was uncertain how to act. Had he foreseen this arrest? Had he not, in all probability, been the cause of it? Those questions I could not resolve. But in the meantime, what was I to do? Should I announce the arrest openly at Styles, or not? Though I did not acknowledge it to myself, the thought of Mary Cavendish was weighing on me. Would it not be a terrible shock to her? For the moment, I set aside utterly any suspicions of her. She could not be implicated, otherwise I should have heard some hint of it. Of course, there was no possibility of being able permanently to conceal Dr. Bowerstein's arrest from her. It would be announced in every newspaper on the morrow. Still, I shrank from blurting it out. If only Poirot had been accessible, I could have asked his advice. What possessed him to go posting off to London in this unaccountable way? In spite of myself, my opinion of his sagacity was immeasurably heightened. I would never have dreamt of suspecting the doctor had not Poirot put it into my head. Yes, decidedly, the little man was clever. After some reflecting, I decided to take John into my confidence and leave him to make the matter public or not, as he thought, fit. He gave vent to a prodigious whistle as I imparted the news. Great Scott! You were right then. I couldn't believe it at the time. No, it is astonishing until you get used to the idea and see how it makes everything fit in. Now, what are we to do? Of course, it will be generally known tomorrow. John reflected. Never mind, he said at last. We won't say anything at present. There is no need. As you say, it will be known soon enough. But to my intense surprise, on getting down early the next morning and eagerly opening the newspapers, there was not a word about the arrest. There was a column of mere padding about the Styles poisoning case, but nothing further. It was rather inexplicable, but I suppose that, for some reason or other, Jap wished to keep it out of the papers. It worried me just a little for it suggested the possibility that there might be further arrests to come. After breakfast, I decided to go down to the village and see if Poirot had returned yet. But, before I could start, a well-known face blocked one of the windows and the well-known voice said, Bonjour, mon ami! Poirot? I exclaimed, with relief, and seizing him by both hands, I dragged him into the room. I was never so glad to see anyone. Listen, I have said nothing to anybody but John. Is that right? My friend, replied Poirot, I do not know what you are talking about. Dr. Bowerstein's arrest, of course, sir, I answered impatiently. Is Bowerstein arrested then? Did you not know it? Not the least in the world. But, pausing a moment, he added, Still, it does not surprise me. After all, we are only four miles from the coast. The coast? I asked, puzzled. What has that got to do with it? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Surely it is obvious. Not to me. No doubt I am very dense, but I cannot see what the proximity of the coast has got to do with the murder of Mrs. Inglethorpe. Nothing at all, of course, replied Poirot smiling. But we were speaking of the arrest of Dr. Bowerstein. Well, he is arrested for the murder of Mrs. Inglethorpe. 
What? cried Poirot, in apparently lively astonishment. Dr. Bauerstein arrested for the murder of Mrs. E. Inglethorpe. Yes. Impossible. That would be too good a farce. Who told you that, my friend? Well, no one exactly told me, I confessed. But he is arrested. Oh, yes, very likely. But for espionage, mon ami. Espionage? I gasped. Precisely. Not for poisoning Mrs. Inglethorpe? Not unless our friend Jap has taken leave of his senses, replied Poirot placidly. But, but I thought you thought so too. Poirot gave me one look, which conveyed a wondering pity and his full sense of the utter absurdity of such an idea. Do you mean to say, I asked, slowly adapting myself to the new idea, that Dr. Bauerstein is a spy? Poirot nodded. Have you never suspected it? It never entered my head. It did not strike you as peculiar that a famous London doctor should bury himself in a little village like this and should be in the habit of walking about at all hours of the night, fully dressed. No, I confessed, I never thought of such a thing. He is, of course, a German by birth, said Poirot thoughtfully, though he has practised so long in this country that nobody thinks of him as anything but an Englishman. He was naturalised about fifteen years ago, a very clever man, a Jew, of course. The blackguard, I cried indignantly. Not at all. He is, on the contrary, a patriot. Think what he stands to lose. I admire the man myself. But I could not look at it in Poirot's philosophical way. And this is the man with whom Mrs. Cavendish has been wandering about all over the country, I cried indignantly. Yes, I should fancy he had found her very useful, remarked Poirot. So long as gossip busied itself in coupling their names together, any other vagaries of the doctors passed unobserved. Then you think he never really cared for her? I asked eagerly, rather too eagerly, perhaps, under the circumstances. That, of course, I cannot say, but shall I tell you my own private opinion, Hastings? Yes. Well, it is this, that Mrs. Cavendish does not care and never has cared one little jot about Dr. Bowerstein. Do you really think so? I could not disguise my pleasure. I am quite sure of it, and I will tell you why. Yes? Because she cares for someone else, mon ami. Oh, what did he mean? In spite of myself, an agreeable warmth spread over me. I am not a vain man where women are concerned, but I remembered certain evidences, too lightly thought of at the time, perhaps, but which certainly seemed to indicate... My pleasing thoughts were interrupted by the sudden entrance of Miss Howard. She glanced round hastily to make sure there was no one else in the room and quickly produced an old sheet of brown paper. This she handed to Poirot, murmuring as she did so, the cryptic words, on top of the wardrobe. Then she hurriedly left the room. Poirot unfolded the sheet of paper eagerly and uttered an exclamation of satisfaction. He spread it out on the table. Come here, Hastings. Now tell me, what is that initial, J or L? It was a medium-sized sheet of paper, rather dusty, as though it had lain by for some time. But it was the label that was attracting Poirot's attention. At the top, it bore the printed stamp of Messrs. Parkson's, the well-known theatrical costumiers, and it was addressed to the debatable initial, Cavendish, Eske, Styles Court, Styles St. Mary, Essex. It might be T or it might be L, I said, after studying the thing for a minute or two. It certainly isn't a J. Good, replied Poirot, folding up the paper again. I also am of your way of thinking. It is an L. Depend upon it. Where did it come from? 
I asked curiously. Is it important? Moderately so. It confirms a surmise of mine. Having deduced its existence, I set Miss Howard to search for it and, as you see, she has been successful. What did she mean by, on the top of the wardrobe? She meant, replied Poirot promptly, that she found it on top of a wardrobe. A funny place for a piece of brown paper, I mused. Not at all. The top of a wardrobe is an excellent place for brown paper and cardboard boxes. I have kept them there myself. Neatly arranged, there is nothing to offend the eye. Poirot, I asked earnestly, have you made up your mind about this crime? Yes, that is to say, I believe I know how it was committed. Ah. Unfortunately, I have no proof beyond my surmise, unless... With sudden energy, he caught me by the arm and whirled me down the hall, calling out in French in his excitement, Mademoiselle Dorcas, Mademoiselle Dorcas, un moment, s'il vous plaît. Dorcas, quite flurried by the noise, came hurrying out of the pantry. My good Dorcas, I have an idea, a little idea, if it should prove justified, what magnificent chance. Tell me, on Monday, not Tuesday, Dorcas, but Monday, the day before the tragedy, did anything go wrong with Mrs. Inglethorpe's bell? Dorcas looked very surprised. Yes, sir, now you mention it, it did, though I don't know how you came to hear of it. A mouse, or some such, must have nibbled the wire through. The man came and put it right on Tuesday morning. With a long-drawn exclamation of ecstasy, Poirot led the way back to the morning room. See you, one should not ask for outside proof. No, reason should be enough. But the flesh is weak. It is consolation to find that one is on the right track. Ah, my friend, I am like a giant refreshed. I run, I leap. And in very truth, run and leap he did, gambling wildly down the stretch of lawn outside the long window. What is your remarkable little friend doing? asked a voice behind me, and I turned to find Mary Cavendish at my elbow. She smiled, and so did I. What is it all about? Really, I can't tell you. He asked Dorcas some question about a bell, and appeared so delighted with her answer that he is capering about as you see. Mary laughed. How ridiculous! He's going out of the gate! Isn't he coming back today? I don't know. I've given up trying to guess what he'll do next. Is he quite mad, Mr. Hastings? I honestly don't know. Sometimes I feel sure he is as mad as a hatter. And then, just as he is at his maddest, I find there is method in his madness. I see. In spite of her laugh, Mary was looking thoughtful this morning. She seemed grave, almost sad. It occurred to me that it would be a good opportunity to tackle her on the subject of Cynthia. I began rather tactfully, I thought, but I had not gone far before she stopped me authoritatively. You are an excellent advocate, I have no doubt, Mr. Hastings, but in this case, your talents are quite thrown away. Cynthia will run no risk of encountering any unkindness from me. I began to stammer feebly that I hoped she hadn't thought. But again she stopped me, and her words were so unexpected that they quite drove Cynthia and her troubles out of my mind. Mr. Hastings, she said, do you think I and my husband are happy together? I was considerably taken aback and murmured something about it's not being my business to think anything of the sort. Well she said quietly. Whether it is your business or not, I will tell you that we are not happy. I said nothing, for I saw that she had not finished. She began slowly, walking up and down the room, her head a little bent, and that slim, supple figure of hers swaying gently as she walked. She stopped suddenly and looked up at me. You don't know anything about me, do you? she asked where I come from, 
who I was before I married John, anything in fact. Well, I will tell you. I will make a father confessor of you. You are kind, I think. Yes, I am sure you are kind. Somehow I was not quite as elated as I might have been. I remembered that Cynthia had begun her confidences in much the same way. Besides, a father confessor should be elderly. It is not at all the role for a young man. My father was English, said Mrs. Cavendish, but my mother was a Russian. Ah, I said, now I understand. Understand what? A hint of something foreign, different, that there has always been about you. My mother was very beautiful, I believe. I don't know, because I never saw her. She died when I was quite a little child. I believe there was some tragedy connected with her death. She took an overdose of some sleeping draught by mistake. However that may be, my father was broken-hearted. Shortly afterwards, he went into the consular service. Everywhere he went, I went with him. When I was 23, I had been nearly all over the world. It was a splendid life. I loved it. There was a smile on her face, and her head was thrown back. She seemed living in the memory of those old glad days. Then my father died. He left me very badly off. I had to go and live with some old aunts in Yorkshire. She shuddered. You will understand me when I say that it was a deadly life for a girl brought up as I had been. The narrowness, the deadly monotony of it almost drove me mad. She paused a minute and added in a different tone, And then I met John Cavendish. Yes. You can imagine that, from my aunt's point of view, it was a very good match for me. But I can honestly say it was not this fact which weighed with me. No, he was simply a way of escape from the insufferable monotony of my life. I said nothing, and after a moment she went on. Don't misunderstand me, I was quite honest with him. I told him what was true, that I liked him very much, that I hoped to come to like him more, but that I was not in any way what the world calls in love with him. He declared that that satisfied him, and so we were married. She waited a long time. A little frown had gathered on her forehead. She seemed to be looking back earnestly into those past days. I think, I am sure, he cared for me at first, but I suppose we were not well matched. Almost at once we drifted apart. He, it is not a pleasing thing for my pride, but it is the truth tired of me very soon. I must have made some murmur of dissent, for she went on quickly. Oh, yes, he did. Not that it matters now, now that we've come to the parting of the ways. What do you mean? She answered quietly. I mean that I am not going to remain at Stiles. You and John are not going to live here? John may live here, but I shall not. You are going to leave him? Yes. But why? She paused a long time and said at last, Perhaps, because I want to be free. And as she spoke, I had a sudden vision of broad spaces, virgin tracts of forests, untrodden lands, and a realization of what freedom would mean to such a nature as Mary Cavendish. I seemed to see her for a moment as she was, a proud, wild creature as untamed by civilization as some shy bird of the hills. A little cry broke from her lips. You don't know, you don't know, how this hateful place has been prison to me. I understand, I said, but, but don't do anything rash. Oh, rash, her voice mocked at my prudence. Then suddenly I said a thing I could have bitten out my tongue for. You know that Dr. Bowerstein has been arrested. An instant coldness passed like a mask over her face, blotting out all expression. John was so kind as to break that to me this morning. Well, what do you think? I asked feebly. Of what? Of the arrest?
What should I think? Apparently he is a German spy, so the gardener had told John. Her face and voice were absolutely cold and expressionless. Did she care, or did she not? She moved away a step or two and fingered one of the flower vases. These are quite dead. I must do them again. Would you mind moving? Thank you, Mr. Hastings. And she walked quietly past me out of the window, with a cool little nod of dismissal. No, surely she could not care for Bauerstein. No woman could act her part with that icy unconcern. Poirot did not make his appearance the following morning, and there was no sign of the Scotland Yard men. But at lunchtime, there arrived a new piece of evidence, or rather, lack of evidence. We had vainly tried to trace the fourth letter, which Mrs. Inglethorpe had written on the evening preceding her death. Our efforts having been in vain, we had abandoned the matter, hoping that it might turn up of itself one day. And this is just what did happen, in the shape of a communication, which arrived by the second post from a firm of French music publishers, acknowledging Mrs. Inglethorpe's cheque and regretting they had been unable to trace a certain series of Russian folk songs. So the last hope of solving the mystery, by means of Mrs. Inglethorpe's correspondence on the fatal evening, had to be abandoned. Just before tea, I strolled down to tell Poirot of the new disappointment, but found, to my annoyance, that he was once more out. Gone to London again? Oh no, monsieur. He has but taken the train to Tadminster. To see a young lady's dispensary, he said. Silly ass, I ejaculated. I told him Wednesday was the one day she wasn't there. Well, tell him to look us up tomorrow morning, will you? Certainly, monsieur. But on the following day, no sign of Poirot. I was getting angry. He was really treating us in the most cavalier fashion. After lunch, Lawrence drew me aside and asked if I was going down to see him. No, I don't think I shall. He can come up here if he wants to see us. Oh, Lawrence looked indeterminate. Something unusually nervous and excited in his manner roused my curiosity. What is it? I asked. I could go if there's anything special. It's nothing much, but, well, if you are going, will you tell him... He dropped his voice to a whisper. I think I've found the extra coffee cup. I had almost forgotten that enigmatical message of Poirot's, but now my curiosity was aroused afresh. Lawrence would say no more, so I decided that I would descend from my high horse and once more seek out Poirot at Leastway Cottage. This time I was received with a smile. Monsieur Poirot was within. Would I mount? I mounted accordingly. Poirot was sitting by the table, his head buried in his hands. He sprang up at my entrance. What is it? I asked solicitously. You are not ill, I trust. No, no, not ill. But I decide an affair of great moment. Whether to catch the criminal or not, I asked facetiously. But, to my great surprise, Poirot nodded gravely. To speak or not to speak, as your so great Shakespeare says, that is the question. I did not trouble to correct the quotation. You are not serious, Poirot. I am of the most serious for the most serious of all things hangs in the balance. And that is? A woman's happiness, mon ami, he said gravely. I didn't quite know what to say. The moment has come, said Poirot thoughtfully, and I do not know what to do. For see you, it is a big stake for which I play. No one but I, Hercule Poirot, would attempt it and he tapped himself proudly on the breast. After pausing a few minutes respectfully, so as not to spoil his effect, I gave him Lawrence's message. Aha, he cried. So he has found the extra coffee cup. That is good. 
He has more intelligence than would appear, this long-faced Monsieur Lawrence of yours. I did not myself think very highly of Lawrence's intelligence, but I forbore to contradict Poirot and gently took him to task for forgetting my instructions as to which were Cynthia's days off. It is true, I have the head of a sieve. However, the other young lady was most kind. She was sorry for my disappointment and showed me everything in the kindest way. Oh, well, that's all right then, and you must go to tea with Cynthia another day. I told him about the letter. I'm sorry for that, he said. I always had hopes of that letter. But no, it was not to be. This affair must all be unravelled from within. He tapped his forehead. These little grey cells. It is up to them, as you say over here. Then, suddenly, he asked, Are you a judge of finger marks, my friend? No, I said, rather surprised. I know that there are no two finger marks alike, but that's as far as my science goes. Exactly. He unlocked a little drawer and took out some photographs, which he laid on the table. I have numbered them one, two, three. Will you describe them to me? I studied the proofs attentively. All greatly magnified, I see. Number one, I should say, are a man's fingerprints, thumb and first finger. Number two are a lady's. They are much smaller and quite different in every way. No. Three. I paused for some time. There seemed to be a lot of confused finger marks, but here, very distinctly, are number ones. Overlapping the others? Yes. You recognize them beyond fail? Oh yes, they are identical. Poirot nodded, and gently taking the photographs from me, locked them up again. I suppose, I said, that as usual, you are not going to explain. On the contrary, no. One were the fingerprints of Monsieur Lawrence. Number two were those of Mademoiselle Cynthia. They are not important. I merely obtained them for comparison. Number three is a little more complicated. Yes, it is, as you see, highly magnified. You may have noticed a sort of blur extending all across the picture. I will not describe to you the special apparatus, dusting powder, etc., which I used. It is a well-known process to the police, and by means of it, you can obtain a photograph of the fingerprints of any object in a very short space of time. Well, my friend, you have seen the finger marks. It remains to tell you the particular object on which they had been left. Go on, I am really excited. Eh bien, photo number three represents the highly magnified surface of a tiny bottle in the top poison cupboard of the dispensary in the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster, which sounds like the house that Jack built. Good heavens, I exclaimed. But what were Lawrence Cavendish's finger marks doing on it? He never went near the poison cupboard the day we were there. Oh, yes, he did. Impossible. We were all together the whole time. Poirot shook his head. No, my friend. There was a moment when you were not all together. There was a moment when you could not have been all together, or it would not have been necessary to call to Monsieur Lawrence to come and join you on the balcony. I'd forgotten that, I admitted, but it was only for a moment. Long enough. Long enough for what? Poirot's smile became rather enigmatical. Long enough for a gentleman who had once studied medicine to gratify a very natural interest and curiosity. Our eyes met. Poirot's were pleasantly vague. He got up and hummed a little tune. I watched him suspiciously. Poirot, I said, what was in this particular little bottle? Poirot looked out of the window. Hydrochloride of strychnine, he said over his shoulder continuing to hum. Good heavens! I said it quite quietly. I was not surprised. I had expected that answer. 
They use the pure hydrochloride of strychnine very little, only occasionally for pills. It is the official solution lick, strychnine hydrochlor, that is used in most medicines. That is why the finger marks have remained undisturbed since then. How did you manage to take this photograph? I dropped my hat from the balcony, explained Poirot simply. Visitors were not permitted below at that hour, so in spite of my many apologies, Mademoiselle Cynthia's colleague had to go down and fetch it for me. Then you knew what you were going to find? No, not at all. I merely realised that it was possible from your story for Monsieur Lawrence to go to the poison cupboard. The possibility had to be confirmed or eliminated. Poirot, I said, your gaiety does not deceive me. This is a very important discovery. I do not know, said Poirot, but one thing does strike me. No doubt it has struck you too. What is that? Why, that there is altogether too much strychnine about this case. This is the third time we run up against it. There was strychnine in Mrs. Inglethorpe's tonic. There is the strychnine sold across the counter at Stiles St. Mary by Mace. Now we have more strychnine, handled by one of the household. It is confusing. And, as you know, I do not like confusion. Before I could reply, one of the other Belgians opened the door and stuck his head in. There is a lady below, asking for Mr. Hastings. A lady? I jumped up. Poirot followed me down the narrow stairs. Mary Cavendish was standing in the doorway. I have been visiting an old woman in the village, she explained. And as Lawrence told me, you were with Monsieur Poirot, I thought I would call for you. Alas, madame said Poirot. I thought you had come to honour me with a visit. I will some day if you ask me, she promised him, smiling. That is well. If you should need a father confessor, madam, she started ever so slightly. Remember, Papa Poirot is always at your service. She stared at him for a few minutes, as though seeking to read some deeper meaning into his words. Then she turned abruptly away. Come, will you not walk back with us too, Monsieur Poirot? Enchanted, madame. All the way to Stiles, Mary talked fast and feverishly. It struck me that in some way she was nervous of Poirot's eyes. The weather had broken, and the sharp wind was almost autumnal in its shrewishness. Mary shivered a little and buttoned her black sports coat closer. The wind through the trees made a mournful noise, like some great giant sighing. We walked up to the great door of Stiles, and at once the knowledge came to us that something was wrong. Dorcas came running out to meet us. She was crying and wringing her hands. I was aware of other servants huddled together in the background, all eyes and ears. Oh, mum, oh, mum. I don't know how to tell you. What is it, Dorcas? I asked impatiently. Tell us at once. It's those wicked detectives. They've arrested him. They've arrested Mr. Cavendish. Arrested Lawrence? I gasped. I saw a strange look come into Dorcas's eyes. No, sir, not Mr. Lawrence, Mr. John. Behind me, with a wild cry, Mary Cavendish fell heavily against me, and as I turned to catch her, I met the quiet triumph in Poirot's eyes. Chapter 11 The Case for the Prosecution The trial of John Cavendish for the murder of his stepmother took place two months later. Of the intervening weeks, I will say little, but my admiration and sympathy went out unfeignedly to Mary Cavendish. She ranged herself passionately on her husband's side, scorning the mere idea of his guilt, and fought for him tooth and nail. I expressed my admiration to Poirot, and he nodded thoughtfully. Yes, she is of those women who show at their best in adversity. It brings out all that is sweetest and truest in them, 
Her pride and her jealousy have... Jealousy? I queried. Yes. Have you not realised that she is an unusually jealous woman? As I was saying, her pride and jealousy have been laid aside. She thinks of nothing but her husband and the terrible fate that is hanging over him. He spoke very feelingly, and I looked at him earnestly, remembering that last afternoon, when he had been deliberating whether or not to speak. With his tenderness for a woman's happiness, I felt glad that the decision had been taken out of his hands. Even now, I said, I can hardly believe it. You see, up to the very last minute, I thought it was Laurence. Poirot grinned. I know you did. But John, my old friend John. Every murderer is probably somebody's old friend, observed Poirot philosophically. You cannot mix up sentiment and reason. I must say I think you might have given me a hint. Perhaps, mon ami, I did not do so, just because he was your old friend. I was rather disconcerted by this, remembering how I had busily passed on to John what I believed to be Poirot's views concerning Bauerstein. He, by the way, had been acquitted of the charge brought against him. Nevertheless, although he had been too clever for them this time, and the charge of espionage could not be brought home to him, his wings were pretty well clipped for the future. I asked Poirot whether he thought John would be condemned. To my intense surprise, he replied that, on the contrary, he was extremely likely to be acquitted. But Poirot, I protested. Oh, my friend, have I not said to you all along that I have no proofs? It is one thing to know that a man is guilty. It is quite another matter to prove him so. And in this case, there is terribly little evidence. That is the whole trouble. I, Hercule Poirot, know, but I lack the last link in my chain. And unless I can find that missing link... He shook his head gravely. When did you first suspect John Cavendish? I asked after a minute or two. Did you not suspect him at all? No, indeed. Not after that fragment of conversation you overheard between Mrs. Cavendish and her mother-in-law and her subsequent lack of frankness at the inquest. No. Did you not put two and two together and reflect that if it was not Alfred Inglethorpe who was quarrelling with his wife, and you remember, he strenuously denied it at the inquest, it must be either Lawrence or John. Now, if it was Lawrence, Mary Cavendish's conduct was just as inexplicable. But if, on the other hand, it was John, the whole thing was explained quite naturally. So, I cried, a light breaking in upon me. It was John who quarrelled with his mother that afternoon. Exactly. And you have known this all along? Certainly. Mrs. Cavendish's behaviour could only be explained that way. And yet, you say he may be acquitted? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Certainly I do. At the police court proceedings, we shall hear the case for the prosecution, but in all probability, his solicitors will advise him to reserve his defence. That will be sprung upon us at the trial. And, ah, by the way, I have a word of caution to give you, my friend. I must not appear in the case. What? No. Officially, I have nothing to do with it. Until I have found that last link in my chain, I must remain behind the scenes. Mrs. Cavendish must think I am working for her husband, not against him. I say, that's playing it a bit low down, I protested. Not at all. We have to deal with a most clever and unscrupulous man and we must use any means in our power. Otherwise, he will slip through our fingers. That is why I have been careful to remain in the background. All the discoveries have been made by Jap, and Jap will take all the credit. If I am called upon to give evidence at all, he smiled broadly, it will probably be as a witness for the defence. I could hardly believe my ears. It is quite en règle, continued Poirot. Strangely enough, I can give evidence that will demolish one contention of the prosecution. 
Which one? The one that relates to the destruction of the will. John Cavendish did not destroy that will. Poirot was a true prophet. I will not go into the details of the police court proceedings as it involves many tiresome repetitions. I will merely state baldly that John Cavendish reserved his defence and was duly committed for trial. September found us all in London. Mary took a house in Kensington, Poirot being included in the family party. I myself had been given a job at the war office, so was able to see them continually. As the weeks went by, the state of Poirot's nerves grew worse and worse. That last link he talked about was still lacking. Privately, I hoped it might remain so, for what happiness could there be for Mary if John were not acquitted? On September 15th, John Cavendish appeared in the dock at the Old Bailey, charged with the willful murder of Emily Agnes Inglethorpe and pleaded not guilty. Sir Ernest Heavyweather, the famous KC, had been engaged to defend him. Mr. Phillips, KC, opened the case for the Crown. The murder, he said, was a most premeditated and cold-blooded one. It was neither more nor less than the deliberate poisoning of a fond and trusting woman by the stepson to whom she had been more than a mother. Ever since his boyhood, she had supported him. He and his wife had lived at Styles Court in every luxury, surrounded by her care and attention. She had been their kind and generous benefactress. He proposed to call witnesses to show how the prisoner, a profligate and spendthrift, had been at the end of his financial tether and had also been carrying on an intrigue with a certain Mrs. Rakes, a neighbouring farmer's wife. This having come to his stepmother's ears, she taxed him with it on the afternoon before her death, and a quarrel ensued, part of which was overheard. On the previous day, the prisoner had purchased strychnine at the village chemist's shop, wearing a disguise by means of which he hoped to throw the onus of the crime upon another man, to wit, Mrs. Inglethorpe's husband, of whom he had been bitterly jealous. Luckily for Mr. Inglethorpe, he had been able to produce an unimpeachable alibi. On the afternoon of July 17th, continued counsel, immediately after the quarrel with her son, Mrs. Inglethorpe made a new will. This will was found destroyed in the grate of her bedroom the following morning, but evidence had come to light which showed that it had been drawn up in favour of her husband. Deceased had already made a will in his favour before her marriage, but, and Mr. Phillips wagged an expressive forefinger, the prisoner was not aware of that. What had induced the deceased to make a fresh will, with the old one still extant, he could not say. She was an old lady, and might possibly have forgotten the former one, or, this seemed to him more likely, she may have had an idea that it was revoked by her marriage, as there had been some conversation on the subject. Ladies were not always very well versed in legal knowledge. She had, about a year before, executed a will in favour of the prisoner, he would call evidence to show that it was the prisoner who ultimately handed his stepmother her coffee on the fatal night. Later in the evening, he had sought admission to her room, on which occasion, no doubt, he found an opportunity of destroying the will which, as far as he knew, would render the one in his favour valid. The prisoner had been arrested in consequence of the discovery, in his room, by Detective Inspector Jap, a most brilliant officer, of the identical file of strychnine which had been sold at the village chemist's to the supposed Mr. Inglethorpe on the day before the murder. It would be for the jury to decide whether or not these damning facts constituted an overwhelming proof of the prisoner's guilt, and, subtly implying that a jury which did not so decide, was quite unthinkable Mr. Phillips sat down and wiped his forehead. The first witnesses for the prosecution were mostly those who had been called at the inquest. 
the medical evidence being again taken first. Sir Ernest Heavyweather, who was famous all over England for the unscrupulous manner in which he bullied witnesses, only asked two questions. I take it, Dr. Bauerstein, that strychnine, as a drug, acts quickly? Yes. And that you are unable to account for the delay in this case? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Mace identified the file handed him by counsel, as that sold by him to Mr. Inglethorpe. Pressed, he admitted that he only knew Mr. Inglethorpe by sight. He had never spoken to him. The witness was not cross-examined. Alfred Inglethorpe was called and denied having purchased the poison. He also denied having quarrelled with his wife. Various witnesses testified to the accuracy of these statements. The gardener's evidence as to the witnessing of the will was taken and then Dorcas was called. Dorcas, faithful to her young gentleman, denied strenuously that it could have been John's voice she heard and resolutely declared, in the teeth of everything, that it was Mr. Inglethorpe who had been in the boudoir with her mistress. A rather wistful smile passed across the face of the prisoner in the dock. He knew only too well how useless her gallant defiance was, since it was not the object of the defence to deny this point. Mrs. Cavendish, of course, could not be called upon to give evidence against her husband. After various questions on other matters, Mr. Phillips asked, In the month of June last, do you remember a parcel arriving for Mr. Lawrence Cavendish from Parkson's? Dorcas shook her head. I don't remember, sir. It may have done, but Mr. Lawrence was away from home part of June. In the event of a parcel arriving for him whilst he was away, what would be done with it? It would either be put in his room or sent on after him. By you? No, sir, I should leave it on the hall table. It would be Miss Howard who would attend to anything like that. Evelyn Howard was called and, after being examined on other points, was questioned as to the parcel. Don't remember. Lots of parcels come. Can't remember one special one. You do not know if it was sent after Mr. Lawrence Cavendish to Wales or whether it was put in his room. Don't think it was sent after him. Should have remembered it if it was. Supposing a parcel arrived addressed to Mr. Lawrence Cavendish and afterwards it disappeared, should you remark its absence? No, don't think so. I should think someone had taken charge of it. I believe, Miss Howard, that it was you who found this sheet of brown paper. He held up the same dusty piece which Poirot and I had examined in the morning room at Stiles. Yes, I did. How did you come to look for it? The Belgian detective who was employed on the case asked me to search for it. Where did you eventually discover it? On the top of, of, a wardrobe. On top of the prisoner's wardrobe? I, I believe so. Did you not find it yourself? Yes. Then you must know where you found it? Yes, it was on the prisoner's wardrobe. That is better. An assistant from Parkson's, theatrical costumier, testified that on June 29th, they had supplied a black beard to Mr. L. Cavendish, as requested. It was ordered by letter, and a postal order was enclosed. No, they had not kept the letter. All transactions were entered in their books. They had sent the beard, as directed, to L. Cavendish Esctur's Styles Court. Sir Ernest Heavyweather rose ponderously. Where was the letter written from? From Styles Court. The same address to which you sent the parcel? Yes. And the letter came from there? Yes. Like a beast of prey, Heavyweather fell upon him. How do you know? I, I don't understand. How do you know that letter came from Styles? Did you notice the postmark? No, but 
Ah, you did not notice the postmark, and yet you affirm so confidently that it came from Styles. It might, in fact, have been any postmark? Y S. In fact, the letter, though written on stamped notepaper, might have been posted from anywhere? From Wales, for instance? The witness admitted that such might be the case, and Sir Ernest signified that he was satisfied. Elizabeth Wells, second housemaid at Stiles, stated that after she had gone to bed, she remembered that she had bolted the front door, instead of leaving it on the latch, as Mr Inglethorpe had requested. She had accordingly gone downstairs again to rectify her error. Hearing a slight noise in the west wing, she had peeped along the passage and had seen Mr John Cavendish knocking at Mrs Inglethorpe's door. Sir Ernest Heavyweather made short work of her, and under his unmerciful bullying, she contradicted herself hopelessly, and Sir Ernest sat down again with a satisfied smile on his face. With the evidence of Annie, as to the candle grease on the floor, and as to seeing the prisoner take the coffee into the boudoir, the proceedings were adjourned until the following day. As we went home, Mary Cavendish spoke bitterly against the prosecuting counsel. That hateful man! What a net he has drawn around my poor John! How he twisted every little fact until he made it seem what it wasn't! Well, I said consolingly, it will be the other way about tomorrow. Yes, she said meditatively, then suddenly dropped her voice. Mr. Hastings, you do not think surely it could not have been Lawrence. Oh no, that could not be. But I myself was puzzled, and as soon as I was alone with Poirot, I asked him what he thought Sir Ernest was driving at. Ah, said Poirot appreciatively, he is a clever man, that Sir Ernest. Do you think he believes Lawrence guilty? I do not think he believes or cares anything. No, what he is trying for is to create such confusion in the minds of the jury that they are divided in their opinion as to which brother did it. He is endeavouring to make out that there is quite as much evidence against Lawrence as against John, and I am not at all sure that he will not succeed. Detective Inspector Jap was the first witness called when the trial was reopened and gave his evidence succinctly and briefly. After relating the earlier events, he proceeded. Acting on information received, Superintendent Summerhay and myself searched the prisoner's room during his temporary absence from the house. In his chest of drawers, hidden beneath some underclothing, we found, first, a pair of gold-rimmed pince-nez, similar to those worn by Mr. Inglethorpe. These were exhibited. Secondly, this file. The file was that already recognised by the chemist's assistant, a tiny bottle of blue glass containing a few grains of a white crystalline powder and labelled strychnine hydrochloride, poison. A fresh piece of evidence discovered by the detectives since the police court proceedings was a long, almost new piece of blotting paper. It had been found in Mrs Inglethorpe's checkbook and on being reversed at a mirror, showed clearly the words, Oh! A thing of which I die possessed I leave to my beloved husband, Alfred Ing. This placed beyond question the fact that the destroyed will had been in favour of the deceased lady's husband. Jap then produced the charred fragment of paper recovered from the grate, and this, with the discovery of the beard in the attic, completed his evidence. But Sir Ernest's cross-examination was yet to come. What day was it when you searched the prisoner's room? Tuesday, the 24th of July. Exactly a week after the tragedy? Yes. You found these two objects, you say, in the chest of drawers. Was the drawer unlocked? Yes. Does it not strike you as unlikely that a man who had committed a crime should keep the evidence of it in an unlocked drawer for anyone to find. He might have stowed them there in a hurry. But you have just said it was a whole week since the crime. He would have had ample time to remove them and destroy them. 
perhaps. There is no perhaps about it. Would he or would he not have had plenty of time to remove and destroy them? Yes. Was the pile of underclothes under which the things were hidden heavy or light? Heavyish. In other words, it was winter underclothing. Obviously, the prisoner would not be likely to go to that drawer. Perhaps not. Kindly answer my question. Would the prisoner, in the hottest week of a hot summer, be likely to go to a drawer containing winter underclothing? Yes or no? No. In that case, is it not possible that the articles in question might have been put there by a third person and that the prisoner was quite unaware of their presence? I should not think it likely. But it is possible? Yes. That is all. More evidence followed. Evidence as to the financial difficulties in which the prisoner had found himself at the end of July. Evidence as to his intrigue with Mrs. Rakes. Poor Mary. That must have been bitter hearing for a woman of her pride. Evelyn Howard had been right in her facts, though her animosity against Alfred Inglethorpe had caused her to jump to the conclusion that he was the person concerned. Lawrence Cavendish was then put into the box. In a low voice, in answer to Mr. Phillips's questions, he denied having ordered anything from Parkson's in June. In fact, on June 29th, he had been staying away in Wales. Instantly, Sir Ernest's chin was shooting pugnaciously forward. You deny having ordered a black beard from Parkson's on June 29th? I do. Ah, in the event of anything happening to your brother, who will inherit Styles Court? The brutality of the question called a flush to Lawrence's pale face. The judge gave vent to a faint murmur of disapprobation, and the prisoner in the dock leant forward angrily. Heavyweather cared nothing for his client's anger. Answer my question, if you please. I suppose, said Lawrence quietly, that I should. What do you mean by you suppose? Your brother has no children? You would inherit it, wouldn't you? Yes. Ah, that's better, said Heavyweather, with ferocious geniality. And you'd inherit a good slice of money too, wouldn't you? Really, Sir Ernest, protested the judge. These questions are not relevant. Sir Ernest bowed, and having shot his arrow, proceeded. On Tuesday, the 17th of July, you went, I believe, with another guest to visit the dispensary at the Red Cross Hospital in Tadminster. Yes. Did you, while you happened to be alone for a few seconds, unlock the poison cupboard and examine some of the bottles? I... I... may have done so. I put it to you that you did do so. Yes. Sir Ernest fairly shot the next question at him. Did you examine one bottle in particular? No, I do not think so. Be careful, Mr. Cavendish. I am referring to a little bottle of hydrochloride of strychnine. Lawrence was turning a sickly greenish colour. No, oh, I am sure I didn't. Then how do you account for the fact that you left the unmistakable impress of your fingerprints on it? The bullying manner was highly efficacious with a nervous disposition. I... I suppose I must have taken up the bottle. I suppose so too. Did you abstract any of the contents of the bottle? Certainly not. Then why did you take it up? I once studied to be a doctor. Such things naturally interest me. Ah, so poisons naturally interest you, do they? Still, you waited to be alone before gratifying that interest of yours? That was pure chance. If the others had been there, I should have done just the same. Still, as it happens, the others were not there? No, but... In fact, during the whole afternoon, you were only alone for a couple of minutes. And it happened, I say, it happened, 
to be during those two minutes that you displayed your natural interest in hydrochloride of strychnine? Lawrence stammered pitiably. I, I... With a satisfied and expressive countenance, Sir Ernest observed, I have nothing more to ask you, Mr. Cavendish. This bit of cross-examination had caused great excitement in court. The heads of the many fashionably attired women present were busily laid together, and their whispers became so loud that the judge angrily threatened to have the court cleared if there was not immediate silence. There was little more evidence. The handwriting experts were called upon for their opinion of the signature of Alfred Inglethorpe in the chemist's poison register. They all declared unanimously that it was certainly not his handwritten and gave it as their view that it might be that of the prisoner disguised. Cross-examined, they admitted that it might be the prisoner's handwritten cleverly counterfeited. Sir Ernest Heavyweather's speech in opening the case for the defence was not a long one, but it was backed by the full force of his emphatic manner. Never, he said, in the course of his long experience, had he known a charge of murder rest on slighter evidence. Not only was it entirely circumstantial, but the greater part of it was practically unproved. Let them take the testimony they had heard and sift it impartially. The strychnine had been found in a drawer in the prisoner's room. That drawer was an unlocked one, as he had pointed out, and he submitted that there was no evidence to prove that it was the prisoner who had concealed the poison there. It was, in fact, a wicked and malicious attempt on the part of some third person to fix the crime on the prisoner. The prosecution had been unable to produce a shred of evidence in support of their contention that it was the prisoner who ordered the Blackbeard from Parkson's. The quarrel which had taken place between prisoner and his stepmother was freely admitted, but both it and his financial embarrassments had been grossly exaggerated. His learned friend, Sir Ernest, nodded carelessly at Mr Phillips, had stated that if the prisoner were an innocent man, he would have come forward at the inquest to explain that it was he, and not Mr Inglethorpe, who had been the participator in the quarrel. He thought the facts had been misrepresented. What had actually occurred was this. The prisoner, returning to the house on Tuesday evening, had been authoritatively told that there had been a violent quarrel between Mr and Mrs Inglethorpe. No suspicion had entered the prisoner's head that anyone could possibly have mistaken his voice for that of Mr and Inglethorpe. He naturally concluded that his stepmother had had two quarrels. The prosecution averred that on Monday, July 16th, the prisoner had entered the chemist's shop in the village, disguised as Mr Inglethorpe. The prisoner, on the contrary, was at that time at a lonely spot called Marston's Spinney, where he had been summoned by an anonymous note, couched in blackmailing terms and threatening to reveal certain matters to his wife unless he complied with its demands. The prisoner had, accordingly, gone to the appointed spot and after waiting there vainly for half an hour had returned home. Unfortunately, he had met with no one on the way there or back who could vouch for the truth of his story, but luckily he had kept the note, and it would be produced as evidence. As for the statement relating to the destruction of the will, the prisoner had formerly practised at the bar, and was perfectly well aware that the will made in his favour a year before was automatically revoked by his stepmother's remarriage. He would call evidence to show who did destroy the will, and it was possible that that might open up quite a new view of the case. Finally, he would point out to the jury that there was evidence against other people besides John Cavendish. He would direct their attention to the fact that the evidence against Mr Lawrence Cavendish was quite as strong, if not stronger than that, against his brother. He would now call the prisoner. John acquitted himself well in the witness box. Under Sir Ernest's skilful handling, he told his tale credibly and well. 
the anonymous note received by him was produced and handed to the jury to examine. The readiness with which he admitted his financial difficulties and the disagreement with his stepmother lent value to his denials. At the close of his examination, he paused and said, I should like to make one thing clear. I utterly reject and disapprove of Sir Ernest Heavyweather's insinuations against my brother. My brother, I am convinced, had no more to do with the crime than I have. Sir Ernest merely smiled and noted with a sharp eye that John's protest had produced a very favourable impression on the jury. Then the cross-examination began. I understand you to say that it never entered your head that the witnesses at the inquest could possibly have mistaken your voice for that of Mr Inglethorpe. Is not that very surprising? No, I don't think so. I was told there had been a quarrel between my mother and Mr Inglethorpe, and it never occurred to me that such was not really the case. Not when the servant Dorcas repeated certain fragments of the conversation, fragments which you must have recognised? I did not recognise them. Your memory must be unusually short. No, but we were both angry and, I think, said more than we meant. I paid very little attention to my mother's actual words. Mr Phillips's incredulous sniff was a triumph of forensic skill. He passed on to the subject of the note. You have produced this note very opportunely. Tell me, is there nothing familiar about the handwriting of it? Not that I know of. Do you not think that it bears a marked resemblance to your own handwriting, carelessly disguised? No, I do not think so. I put it to you that it is your own handwriting? No. I put it to you that, anxious to prove an alibi, you conceived the idea of a fictitious and rather incredible appointment and wrote this note yourself in order to bear out your statement. No. Is it not a fact that, at the time you claim to have been waiting about at a solitary and unfrequented spot, you were really in the chemist's shop in Stiles St Mary, where you purchased strychnine in the name of Alfred Inglethorpe? No, that is a lie. I put it to you that, wearing a suit of Mr Inglethorpe's clothes, with a black beard trimmed to resemble his, you were there, and signed the register in his name. That is absolutely untrue. Then I will leave the remarkable similarity of handwriting between the note, the register, and your own to the consideration of the jury, said Mr Phillips, and sat down with the air of a man who has done his duty, but who was nevertheless horrified by such deliberate perjury. After this, as it was growing late, the case was adjourned till Monday. Poirot, I noticed, was looking profoundly discouraged. He had that little frown between the eyes that I knew so well. What is it, Poirot? I inquired. Ah, mon ami, things are going badly, badly. In spite of myself, my heart gave a leap of relief. Evidently, there was a likelihood of John Cavendish being acquitted. When we reached the house, my little friend waved aside Mary's offer of tea. No, I thank you, madam. I will mount to my room. I followed him. Still frowning, he went across to the desk and took out a small pack of patience cards. Then he drew up a chair to the table and, to my utter amazement, began solemnly to build card houses. My jaw dropped involuntarily and he said at once, no, mon ami, I am not in my second childhood. I steady my nerves, that is all. This employment requires precision of the fingers. With precision of the fingers goes precision of the brain. And never have I needed that more than now. What is the trouble? I asked. With a great thump on the table, Poirot demolished his carefully built up edifice. It is this, mon ami that I can build card houses seven stories high, but I cannot thump, find, thump, that last link of which I spoke to you. 
I could not quite tell what to say, so I held my peace, and he began slowly building up the cards again, speaking in jerks as he did so. It is done! So, by placing one card on another with mathematical precision, I watched the card house rising under his hands, story by story. He never hesitated or faltered. It was really almost like a conjuring trick. What a steady hand you've got, I remarked. I believe I've only seen your hand shake once. On an occasion when I was enraged, without doubt, observed Poirot with great placidity. Yes, indeed. You were in a towering rage. Do you remember? It was when you discovered that the lock of the dispatch case in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom had been forced. You stood by the mantelpiece, twiddling the things on it in your usual fashion, and your hand shook like a leaf. I must say... But I stopped suddenly, for Poirot, uttering a hoarse and inarticulate cry, again annihilated his masterpiece of cards, and putting his hands over his eyes swayed backwards and forwards, apparently suffering the keenest agony. Good heavens, Poirot, I cried. What is the matter? Are you taken ill? No, no, he gasped. It is, it is, that I have an idea. Oh, I exclaimed, much relieved. One of your little ideas? Ah, ma foi, no, replied Poirot frankly. This time it is an idea gigantic, stupendous, and you, you, my friend, have given it to me. Suddenly clasping me in his arms, he kissed me warmly on both cheeks, and before I had recovered from my surprise, ran headlong from the room. Mary Cavendish entered at that moment. What is the matter with Monsieur Poirot? He rushed past me, crying out, A garage! For the love of heaven, direct me to a garage, madame. And before I could answer, he had dashed out into the street. I hurried to the window. True enough, there he was, tearing down the street, hatless and gesticulating as he went. I turned to Mary with a gesture of despair. He'll be stopped by a policeman in another minute. There he goes, round the corner. Our eyes met, and we stared helplessly at one another. What can be the matter? I shook my head. I don't know. He was building card houses when suddenly he said he had an idea and rushed off as you saw. Well, said Mary, I expect he will be back before dinner. But night fell and Poirot had not returned. Chapter 12. The Last Link. Poirot's abrupt departure had intrigued us all greatly. Sunday morning wore away and still he did not reappear but about three o'clock, a ferocious and prolonged hooting outside drove us to the window to see Poirot alighting from a car, accompanied by Jap and Summerhay. The little man was transformed. He radiated an absurd complacency. He bowed with exaggerated respect to Mary Cavendish. Madame, I have your permission to hold a little reunion in the salon. It is necessary for everyone to attend. Mary smiled sadly. You know, Monsieur Poirot, that you have carte blanche in every way. You are too amiable, madame. Still beaming, Poirot marshaled us all into the drawing room, bringing forward chairs as he did so. Miss Howard, here. Mademoiselle Cynthia, Monsieur Lawrence, the good Dorcas, and Annie. Bien. We must delay our proceedings a few minutes until Mr. Inglethorpe arrives. I have sent him a note. Miss Howard rose immediately from her seat. If that man comes into the house, I leave it. No, no! Poirot went up to her and pleaded in a low voice. Finally, Miss Howard consented to return to her chair. A few minutes later, Alfred Inglethorpe entered the room. The company once assembled, Poirot rose from his seat with the air of a popular lecturer and bowed politely to his audience. Messieurs, mesdames, as you all know, I was called in by Monsieur John Cavendish to investigate this case. 
I at once examined the bedroom of the deceased, which, by the advice of the doctors, had been kept locked and was consequently exactly as it had been when the tragedy occurred. I found, first, a fragment of green material, second, a stain on the carpet near the window, still damp, thirdly, an empty box of bromide powders. To take the fragment of green material first, I found it caught in the bolt of the communicating door between that room and the adjoining one occupied by Mademoiselle Cynthia. I handed the fragment over to the police, who did not consider it of much importance. Nor did they recognise it for what it was, a piece torn from a Greenland armlet. There was a little stir of excitement. Now there was only one person at Stiles who worked on the land, Mrs Cavendish. Therefore it must have been Mrs Cavendish who entered the deceased's room through the door communicating with Mademoiselle Cynthia's room. But that door was bolted on the inside, I cried. When I examined the room, yes. But in the first place, we have only her word for it, since it was she who tried that particular door and reported it fastened. In the ensuing confusion, she would have had ample opportunity to shoot the bolt across. I took an early opportunity of verifying my conjectures. To begin with, the fragment corresponds exactly with a tear in Mrs Cavendish's armlet. Also, at the inquest, Mrs Cavendish declared that she had heard, from her own room, the fall of the table by the bed. I took an early opportunity of testing that statement by stationing my friend, Monsieur Hastings, in the left wing of the building, just outside Mrs Cavendish's door. I myself, in company with the police, went to the deceased's room, and whilst there I, apparently accidentally, knocked over the table in question, but found that, as I had expected, Monsieur Hastings had heard no sound at all. This confirmed my belief that Mrs Cavendish was not speaking the truth when she declared that she had been dressing in her room at the time of the tragedy. In fact, I was convinced that, far from having been in her own room, Mrs Cavendish was actually in the deceased's room when the alarm was given. I shot a quick glance at Mary. She was very pale but smiling. I proceeded to reason on that assumption. Mrs Cavendish is in her mother-in-law's room. We will say that she is seeking for something and has not yet found it. Suddenly, Mrs Inglethorpe awakens and is seized with an alarming paroxysm. She flings out her arm, overturning the bed table, and then pulls desperately at the bell. Mrs Cavendish, startled, drops her candle, scattering the grease on the carpet. She picks it up and retreats quickly to Mademoiselle Cynthia's room, closing the door behind her. She hurries out into the passage, for the servants must not find her where she is. But it is too late. Already footsteps are echoing along the gallery which connects the two wings. What can she do? Quick as thought, she hurries back to the young girl's room and starts shaking her awake. The hastily aroused household come trooping down the passage. They are all busily battering at Mrs Inglethorpe's door. It occurs to nobody that Mrs Cavendish has not arrived with the rest, but, and this is significant, I can find no one who saw her come from the other wing. He looked at Mary Cavendish. Am I right, madame? She bowed her head. Quite right, monsieur. You understand that if I had thought I would do my husband any good by revealing these facts, I would have done so. But it did not seem to me to bear upon the question of his guilt or innocence. In a sense, that is correct, madam, but it cleared my mind of many misconceptions and left me free to see other facts in their true significance. The will? cried Lawrence. Then it was you, Mary, who destroyed the will? She shook her head, and Poirot shook his also. No, he said quietly. There is only one person who could possibly have destroyed that will. Mrs Inglethorpe herself. Impossible, I exclaimed. She had only made it out that very afternoon. Nevertheless, mon ami, it was Mrs Inglethorpe. 
because in no other way can you account for the fact that, on one of the hottest days of the year, Mrs. Inglethorpe ordered a fire to be lighted in her room. I gave a gasp. What idiots we had been never to think of that fire as being incongruous. Poirot was continuing. The temperature on that day, messieurs, was 80 degrees in the shade. Yet Mrs. Inglethorpe ordered a fire. Why? Because she wished to destroy something and could think of no other way. You will remember that in consequence of the war economics practiced at Styles, no waste paper was thrown away. There was therefore no means of destroying a thick document such as a will. The moment I heard of a fire being lighted in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room, I leaped to the conclusion that it was to destroy some important document, possibly a will. So the discovery of the charred fragment in the grate was no surprise to me. I did not, of course, know at the time that the will in question had only been made this afternoon, and I will admit that when I learnt that fact, I fell into a grievous error. I came to the conclusion that Mrs. Inglethorpe's determination to destroy her will arose as a direct consequence of the quarrel she had that afternoon, and that therefore the quarrel took place after, and not before the making of the will. Here, as we know, I was wrong, and I was forced to abandon that idea. I faced the problem from a new standpoint. Now, at four o'clock, Dorcas overheard her mistress saying angrily, You need not think that any fear of publicity or scandal between husband and wife will deter me. I conjectured, and conjectured rightly, that these words were addressed not to her husband, but to Mr. John Cavendish. At five o'clock an hour later, she uses almost the same words, but the standpoint is different. She admits to Dorcas, I don't know what to do. Scandal between husband and wife is a dreadful thing. At four o'clock she has been angry, but completely mistress of herself. At five o'clock she is in violent distress and speaks of having had a great shock. Looking at the matter psychologically, I drew one deduction which I was convinced was correct. The second scandal she spoke of was not the same as the first, and it concerned herself. Let us reconstruct. At four o'clock, Mrs. Inglethorpe quarrels with her son and threatens to denounce him to his wife, who, by the way, overheard the greater part of the conversation. At 4.30, Mrs. Inglethorpe, in consequence of a conversation on the validity of wills, makes a will in favour of her husband, which the two gardeners witness. At five o'clock, Dorcas finds her mistress in a state of considerable agitation with a slip of paper, a letter, Dorcas thinks, in her hand, and it is then that she orders the fire in her room to be lighted. Presumably then, between 4.30 and five o'clock, Something has occurred to occasion a complete revolution of feeling since she is now as anxious to destroy the will as she was before to make it. What was that something? As far as we know, she was quite alone during that half hour. Nobody entered or left that boudoir. What then occasioned this sudden change of sentiment? One can only guess, but I believe my guess to be correct. Mrs. Inglethorpe had no stamps in her desk. We know this, because later she asked Dorcas to bring her some. Now, in the opposite corner of the room, stood her husband's desk, locked. She was anxious to find some stamps and, according to my theory, she tried her own keys in the desk. That one of them fitted, I know. She therefore opened the desk and in searching for the stamps, she came across something else that slip of paper which Dorcas saw in her hand and which assuredly was never meant for Mrs. Inglethorpe's eyes. On the other hand, Mrs. Cavendish believed that the slip of paper to which her mother-in-law clung so tenaciously was a written proof of her own husband's infidelity. She demanded it from Mrs. Inglethorpe, who assured her quite truly that it had nothing to do with that matter. Mrs. Cavendish did not believe her. She thought that Mrs. Inglethorpe was shielding her stepson. Now Mrs. Cavendish is a very resolute woman. And, 
behind her mask of reserve, she was madly jealous of her husband. She determined to get hold of that paper at all costs, and in this resolution, chance came to her aid. She happened to pick up the key of Mrs. Inglethorpe's dispatch case, which had been lost that morning. She knew that her mother-in-law invariably kept all important papers in this particular case. Mrs. Cavendish, therefore, made her plans as only a woman driven desperate through jealousy could have done. Sometime in the evening, she unbolted the door leading into Mademoiselle Cynthia's room. Possibly she applied oil to the hinges, for I found that it opened quite noiselessly when I tried it. She put off her project until the early hours of the morning as being safer, since the servants were accustomed to hearing her move about her room at that time. She dressed completely in her land kit and made her way quietly through Mademoiselle Cynthia's room into that of Mrs. Inglethorpe. He paused a moment, and Cynthia interrupted. But I should have woken up if anyone had come through my room. Not if you were drugged, mademoiselle. Drugged? Mais oui. You remember, he addressed us collectively again, that through all the tumult and noise next door, mademoiselle Cynthia slept. That admitted of two possibilities. Either her sleep was feigned, which I did not believe, or her unconsciousness was induced by artificial means. With this latter idea in my mind, I examined all the coffee cups most carefully, remembering that it was Mrs. Cavendish who had brought Mademoiselle Cynthia her coffee the night before. I took a sample from each cup and had them analysed, with no result. I had counted the cups carefully in the event of one having been removed. Six persons had taken coffee and six cups were duly found. I had to confess myself mistaken then I discovered that I had been guilty of a very grave oversight. Coffee had been brought in for seven persons, not six, for Dr. Bowerstein had been there that evening. This changed the face of the whole affair, for there was now one cup missing. The servants noticed nothing, since Annie, the housemaid, who took in the coffee, brought in seven cups, not knowing that Mr. Inglethorpe never drank it, whereas Dorcas, who cleared them away the following morning, found six as usual. Or, strictly speaking, she found five, the sixth being the one found broken in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room. I was confident that the missing cup was that of Mademoiselle Cynthia. I had an additional reason for that belief in the fact that all the cups found contained sugar, which Mademoiselle Cynthia never took in her coffee. My attention was attracted by the story of Annie, about some salt on the tray of cocoa, which she took every night to Mrs. Inglethorpe's room. I accordingly secured a sample of that cocoa and sent it to be analysed. But that had already been done by Dr. Bowerstein, said Lawrence quickly. Not exactly. The analyst was asked by him to report whether strychnine was or was not present. He did not have it tested, as I did, for a narcotic. For a narcotic? Yes, here is the analyst's report. Mrs. Cavendish administered a safe but effectual narcotic to both Mrs. Inglethorpe and Mademoiselle Cynthia, and it is possible that she had a mauvais quart d'heure in consequence. Imagine her feelings when her mother-in-law is suddenly taken ill and dies, and immediately after she hears the word poison. She has believed that the sleeping draught she administered was perfectly harmless but there is no doubt that for one terrible moment she must have feared that Mrs. Inglethorpe's death lay at her door. She is seized with panic, and under its influence she hurries downstairs and quickly drops the coffee cup and saucer used by Mademoiselle Cynthia into a large brass vase where it is discovered later by Monsieur Lawrence. The remains of the cocoa she dare not touch. Too many eyes are upon her, guess at her relief when strychnine is mentioned, and she discovers that after all the tragedy is not her doing. We are now able to account for the symptoms of strychnine poisoning being so long in making their appearance, 
a narcotic taken with strychnine will delay the action of the poison for some hours. Poirot paused. Mary looked up at him, the colour slowly rising in her face. All you have said is quite true, Monsieur Poirot. It was the most awful hour of my life. I shall never forget it, but you are wonderful. I understand now. What I meant when I told you, that you could safely confess to Papa Poirot, eh? But you would not trust me. I see everything now, said Lawrence. The drugged cocoa, taken on top of the poisoned coffee, amply accounts for the delay. Exactly. But was the coffee poisoned, or was it not? We come to a little difficulty here, since Mrs. Inglethorpe never drank it. What? The cry of surprise was universal. No, you will remember my speaking of a stain on the carpet in Mrs. Inglethorpe's room. There were some peculiar points about that stain. It was still damp, it exhaled a strong odour of coffee, and embedded in the nap of the carpet, I found some little splinters of china. What had happened was plain to me, for not two minutes before I had placed my little case on the table near the window, and the table, tilting up, had deposited it upon the floor, on precisely the identical spot. In exactly the same way, Mrs. Inglethorpe had laid down her cup of coffee on reaching her room the night before, and the treacherous table had played her the same trick. What happened next is mere guesswork on my part, but I should say that Mrs. Inglethorpe picked up the broken cup and placed it on the table by the bed. Feeling in need of a stimulant of some kind, she heated up her cocoa and drank it off then and there. Now we are faced with a new problem. We know the cocoa contained no strychnine. The coffee was never drunk. Yet the strychnine must have been administered between seven and nine o'clock that evening. What third medium was there, a medium so suitable for disguising the taste of strychnine, that it is extraordinary no one has thought of it? Poirot looked round the room and then answered himself impressively. Her medicine! Do you mean that the murderer introduced the strychnine into her tonic? I cried. There was no need to introduce it. It was already there, in the mixture. The strychnine that killed Mrs. Inglethorpe was the identical strychnine prescribed by Dr. Wilkins. To make that clear to you, I will read you an extract from a book on dispensing, which I found in the dispensary of the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster. The following prescription has become famous in textbooks. Strychninae sulf. One grubber, potas bromide. 3v. Aqua ad qual, thrai pine. Fiat mistura. This solution deposits in a few hours the greater part of the strychnine salt as an insoluble bromide in transparent crystals. A lady in England lost her life by taking a similar mixture. The precipitated strychnine collected at the bottom, and in taking the last dose she swallowed nearly all of it. Now there was, of course, no bromide in Dr. Wilkins' prescription, but you will remember that I mentioned an empty box of bromide powders. One or two of those powders introduced into the full bottle of medicine would effectually precipitate the strychnine, as the book describes, and cause it to be taken in the last dose. You will learn later that the person who usually poured out Mrs. Inglethorpe's medicine was always extremely careful not to shake the bottle, but to leave the sediment at the bottom of it undisturbed. Throughout the case, there have been evidences that the tragedy was intended to take place on Monday evening. On that day, Mrs. Inglethorpe's bell wire was neatly cut, and on Monday evening, Mademoiselle Cynthia was spending the night with friends, so that Mrs. Inglethorpe would have been quite alone in the right wing, completely shut off from help of any kind, and would have died, in all probability, before medical aid could have been summoned. 
But in her hurry to be in time for the village entertainment, Mrs Inglethorpe forgot to take her medicine, and the next day she lunched away from home, so that the last, and fatal, dose was actually taken 24 hours later than had been anticipated by the murderer, and it is owing to that delay that the final proof, the last link of the chain, is now in my hands. Amid breathless excitement, he held out three thin strips of paper. A letter in the murderer's own handwriting, mes amis. Had it been a little clearer in its terms, it is possible that Mrs. Inglethorpe, warned in time, would have escaped. As it was, she realised her danger, but not the manner of it. In the deathly silence, Poirot pieced together the slips of paper and, clearing his throat, read, Dearest, Evelyn, you will be anxious at hearing nothing. It is all right, only it will be tonight instead of last night. You understand, there's a good time coming once the old woman is dead and out of the way. No one can possibly bring home the crime to me. That idea of yours about the bromides was a stroke of genius. But we must be very circumspect. A false step. Ah, here, my friends, the letter breaks off. Doubtless the writer was interrupted. But there can be no question as to his identity. We all know this handwriting and... A howl that was almost a scream broke the silence. You devil! How did you get it? A chair was overturned. Poirot skipped nimbly aside. A quick movement on his part, and his assailant fell with a crash. Monsieur, madame, said Poirot with a flourish, let me introduce you to the murderer, Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe. Chapter 13, Poirot Explains. Poirot, you old villain, I said, I've half a mind to strangle you. What do you mean by deceiving me as you have done? We were sitting in the library. Several hectic days lay behind us. In the room below, John and Mary were together once more, while Alfred Inglethorpe and Miss Howard were in custody. Now at last, I had Poirot to myself and could relieve my still burning curiosity. Poirot did not answer me for a moment, but at last he said, I did not deceive you, mon ami. At most, I permitted you to deceive yourself. Yes, but why? Well, it is difficult to explain. You see, my friend, you have a nature so honest and a countenance so transparent that, in fact, to conceal your feelings is impossible. If I had told you my ideas, the very first time you saw Mr. Alfred Inglethorpe, that astute gentleman would have, in your so expressive idiom, smelt a rat, and then bonjour to our chances of catching him. I think that I have more diplomacy than you give me credit for. My friend, besought Poirot, I implore you, do not enrage yourself. Your help has been of the most invaluable. It is but the extremely beautiful nature that you have, which made me pause. Well, I grumbled, a little mollified. I still think you might have given me a hint. But I did, my friend. Several hints. You would not take them. Think now. Did I ever say to you that I believed John Cavendish guilty? Did I not, on the contrary, tell you that he would almost certainly be acquitted? Yes, but... <laughs> and did I not immediately afterwards speak of the difficulty of bringing the murderer to justice? Was it not plain to you that I was speaking of two entirely different persons? No, I said. It was not plain to me. Then again, continued Poirot, at the beginning, did I not repeat to you several times that I didn't want Mr. Inglethorpe arrested now? That should have conveyed something to you. Do you mean to say you suspected him as long ago as that? Yes. To begin with, whoever else might benefit by Mrs. Inglethorpe's death, her husband would benefit the most. There was no getting away from that. When I went up to Styles with you that first day, 
I had no idea as to how the crime had been committed, but from what I knew of Mr Inglethorpe, I fancied that it would be very hard to find anything to connect him with it. When I arrived at the chateau, I realised at once that it was Mrs Inglethorpe who had burnt the will. And there, by the way, you cannot complain, my friend, for I tried my best to force on you the significance of that bedroom fire in midsummer. Yes, yes, I said impatiently. Go on. Well, my friend, as I say, my views as to Mr Inglethorpe's guilt were very much shaken. There was, in fact, so much evidence against him that I was inclined to believe that he had not done it. When did you change your mind? When I found that the more efforts I made to clear him, the more efforts he made to get himself arrested. Then, when I discovered that Inglethorpe had nothing to do with Mrs. Rakes, and that in fact, it was John Cavendish who was interested in that quarter, I was quite sure. But why? Simply this. If it had been Inglethorpe who was carrying on an intrigue with Mrs. Rakes, his silence was perfectly comprehensible. But when I discovered that it was known all over the village that it was John who was attracted by the farmer's pretty wife, his silence bore quite a different interpretation. It was nonsense to pretend that he was afraid of the scandal, as no possible scandal could attach to him. This attitude of his gave me furiously to think, and I was slowly forced to the conclusion that Alfred Inglethorpe wanted to be arrested. Eh bien, from that moment I was equally determined that he should not be arrested. Wait a minute. I don't see why he wished to be arrested. Because, mon ami, it is the law of your country that a man once acquitted can never be tried again for the same offence. Aha! But it was clever, his idea. Assuredly, he is a man of method. See here, he knew that in his position he was bound to be suspected. So he conceived the exceedingly clever idea of preparing a lot of manufactured evidence against himself. He wished to be arrested. He would then produce his irreproachable alibi and, hey presto, he was safe for life. But I still don't see how he managed to prove his alibi and yet go to the chemist's shop. Poirot stared at me in surprise. Is it possible, my poor friend, you have not yet realised that it was Miss Howard who went to the chemist's shop? Miss Howard? But certainly, who else? It was most easy for her. She is of a good height. Her voice is deep and manly. Moreover, remember, she and Inglethorpe are cousins, and there is a distinct resemblance between them, especially in their gait and bearing. It was simplicity itself. They are a clever pair. I am still a little fogged as to how exactly the bromide business was done, I remarked. Bon. I will reconstruct for you as far as possible. I am inclined to think that Miss Howard was the mastermind in that affair. You remember her once mentioning that her father was a doctor? Possibly she dispensed his medicines for him, or she may have taken the idea from one of the many books lying about when Mademoiselle Cynthia was studying for her exam. Anyway, she was familiar with the fact that the addition of a bromide to a mixture containing strychnine would cause the precipitation of the latter. Probably the idea came to her quite suddenly. Mrs Inglethorpe had a box of bromide powders, which she occasionally took at night. What could be easier than quietly to dissolve one or more of those powders in Mrs Inglethorpe's large-sized bottle of medicine when it came from Coots? The risk is practically nil. The tragedy will not take place until nearly a fortnight later. If anyone has seen either of them touching the medicine, they will have forgotten it by that time. Miss Howard will have engineered her quarrel and departed from the house. The lapse of time and her absence will defeat all suspicion. Yes, it was a clever idea. If they had left it alone, it is possible the crime might never have been brought home to them but they were not satisfied. They tried to be too clever, and that was their undoing. 
Poirot puffed at his tiny cigarette, his eyes fixed on the ceiling. They arranged a plan to throw suspicion on John Cavendish by buying strychnine at the village chemist's and signing the register in his handwriting. On Monday, Mrs Inglethorpe will take the last dose of her medicine. On Monday, therefore, at six o'clock, Alfred Inglethorpe arranges to be seen by a number of people at a spot far removed from the village. Miss Howard has previously made up a cock and bull story about him and Mrs Rakes to account for his holding his tongue afterwards. At six o'clock, Miss Howard, disguised as Alfred Inglethorpe, enters the chemist's shop with her story about a dog, obtains the strychnine, and writes the name of Alfred Inglethorpe in John's handwriting, which she had previously studied carefully. But as it will never do if John, too, can prove an alibi, she writes him an anonymous note, still copying his handwriting, which takes him to a remote spot where it is exceedingly unlikely that anyone will see him. So far, all goes well. Miss Howard goes back to Middlingham. Alfred Inglethorpe returns to Stiles. There is nothing that can compromise him in any way, since it is Miss Howard who has the strychnine, which, after all, is only wanted as a blind to throw suspicion on John Cavendish. But now a hitch occurs. Mrs Inglethorpe does not take her medicine that night. The broken bell, Cynthia's absence, arranged by Inglethorpe through his wife, all these are wasted. And then he makes his slip. Mrs Inglethorpe is out, and he sits down to write to his accomplice, who, he fears, may be in a panic at the non-success of their plan. It is probable that Mrs Inglethorpe returned earlier than he expected. Caught in the act, and somewhat flurried, he hastily shuts and locks his desk. He fears that if he remains in the room, he may have to open it again, and that Mrs Inglethorpe might catch sight of the letter before he could snatch it up. So he goes out and walks in the woods, little dreaming that Mrs Inglethorpe will open his desk and discover the incriminating document. But this, as we know, is what happened. Mrs Inglethorpe reads it and becomes aware of the perfidy of her husband and Evelyn Howard, though, unfortunately, the sentence about the bromides conveys no warning to her mind. She knows that she is in danger, but is ignorant of where the danger lies. She decides to say nothing to her husband, but sits down and writes to her solicitor, asking him to come on the morrow and she also determines to destroy immediately the will which she has just made. She keeps the fatal letter. It was to discover that letter, then, that her husband forced the lock of the dispatch case? Yes, and from the enormous risk he ran, we can see how fully he realised its importance. That letter accepted, there was absolutely nothing to connect him with the crime. There's only one thing I can't make out. Why didn't he destroy it at once when he got hold of it? Because he did not dare take the biggest risk of all, that of keeping it on his own person. I don't understand. Look at it from his point of view. I have discovered that there were only five short minutes in which he could have taken it, the five minutes immediately before our own arrival on the scene, for before that time, Annie was brushing the stairs and would have seen anyone who passed going to the right wing. Figure to yourself the scene. He enters the room, unlocking the door by means of one of the other door keys. They were all much alike. He hurries to the dispatch case. It is locked, and the keys are nowhere to be seen. That is a terrible blow to him, for it means that his presence in the room cannot be concealed as he had hoped, but he sees clearly that everything must be risked for the sake of that damning piece of evidence. Quickly, he forces the lock with a penknife and turns over the papers until he finds what he is looking for. But now a fresh dilemma arises. He dare not keep that piece of paper on him. He may be seen leaving the room. He may be searched. If the paper is found on him, it is certain doom. Probably, at this minute too, 
He hears the sounds below of Mr. Wells and John leaving the boudoir. He must act quickly. Where can he hide this terrible slip of paper? The contents of the waste paper basket are kept and, in any case, are sure to be examined. There are no means of destroying it, and he dare not keep it. He looks round and he sees... What do you think, mon ami? I shook my head. In a moment, he has torn the letter into long, thin strips and rolling them up into spills, he thrusts them hurriedly in amongst the other spills in the vase on the mantelpiece. I uttered an exclamation. No one would think of looking there, Poirot continued, and he will be able, at his leisure, to come back and destroy this solitary piece of evidence against him. Then, all the time, it was in the spill vase in Mrs. Inglethorpe's bedroom under our very noses, I cried. Poirot nodded. Yes, my friend, that is where I discovered my last link, and I owe that very fortunate discovery to you. To me? Yes. Do you remember telling me that my hand shook as I was straightening the ornaments on the mantelpiece? Yes, but I don't see a... Uh... No, but I saw. Do you know, my friend, I remembered that earlier in the morning, when we had been there together, I had straightened all the objects on the mantelpiece, and, if they were already straightened, there would be no need to straighten them again, unless, in the meantime, someone else had touched them. Dear me, I murmured. So that is the explanation of your extraordinary behaviour, you rushed down to Stiles and found it still there? Yes, and it was a race for time. But I still can't understand why Inglethorpe was such a fool as to leave it there when he had plenty of opportunity to destroy it. Ah, but he had no opportunity, I saw to that. You? Yes. Do you remember reproving me for taking the household into my confidence on the subject? Yes, well, my friend, I saw there was just one chance. I was not sure then if Inglethorpe was the criminal or not, but if he was, I reasoned that he would not have the paper on him, but would have hidden it somewhere, and by enlisting the sympathy of the household, I could effectually prevent his destroying it. He was already under suspicion, and by making the matter public, I secured the services of about ten amateur detectives who would be watching him unceasingly, and being himself aware of their watchfulness, he would not dare seek further to destroy the document. He was therefore forced to depart from the house, leaving it in the spill vase. But surely Miss Howard had ample opportunities of aiding him. Yes, but Miss Howard did not know of the paper's existence. In accordance with their prearranged plan, she never spoke to Alfred Inglethorpe. They were supposed to be deadly enemies, and until John Cavendish was safely convicted, they neither of them dared risk a meeting. Of course I had a watch kept on Mr Inglethorpe, hoping that sooner or later he would lead me to the hiding place. But he was too clever to take any chances. The paper was safe where it was, since no one had thought of looking there in the first week. It was not likely they would do so afterwards, but for your lucky remark, we might never have been able to bring him to justice. I understand that now. But when did you first begin to suspect Miss Howard? When I discovered that she had told a lie at the inquest about the letter she had received from Mrs Inglethorpe. Why? What was there to lie about? You saw that letter? Do you recall its general appearance? Yes, more or less. You will recollect, then, that Mrs Inglethorpe wrote a very distinctive hand and left large, clear spaces between her words. But if you look at the date at the top of the letter, you will notice that July 17th is quite different in this respect. Do you see what I mean? No, I confessed. I don't. You do not see that that letter was not written on the 17th, but on the 7th, the day after Miss Howard's departure. The one was written in before the seven to turn it into the seventeenth. But why? That is exactly what I asked myself. 
why does Miss Howard suppress the letter written on the 17th and produce this faked one instead? Because she did not wish to show the letter of the 17th. Why again? And at once a suspicion dawned in my mind. You will remember my saying that it was wise to beware of people who were not telling you the truth. And yet, I cried indignantly, after that, you gave me two reasons why Miss Howard could not have committed the crime. And very good reasons too, replied Poirot. For a long time they were a stumbling block to me until I remembered a very significant fact, that she and Alfred Inglethorpe were cousins. She could not have committed the crime single-handed, but the reasons against that did not debar her from being an accomplice. And then, there was that rather over-vehement hatred of hers. It concealed a very opposite emotion. There was, undoubtedly, a tie of passion between them long before he came to Styles. They had already arranged their infamous plot, that he should marry this rich but rather foolish old lady, induce her to make a will leaving her money to him, and then gain their ends by a very cleverly conceived crime. If all had gone as they planned, they would probably have left England and lived together on their poor victim's money. They are a very astute and unscrupulous pair. While suspicion was to be directed against him, she would be making quiet preparations for a very different denouement. She arrives from Middlingham with all the compromising items in her possession. No suspicion attaches to her. No notice is paid to her coming and going in the house. She hides the strychnine and glasses in John's room. She puts the beard in the attic. She will see to it that sooner or later they are duly discovered. I don't quite see why they tried to fix the blame on John, I remarked. It would have been much easier for them to bring the crime home to Lawrence. Yes, but that was mere chance. All the evidence against him arose out of pure accident. It must, in fact, have been distinctly annoying to the pair of schemers. His manner was unfortunate, I observed thoughtfully. Yes, you realise, of course, what was at the back of that. No. You did not understand that he believed Mademoiselle Cynthia guilty of the crime. No, I exclaimed, astonished. Impossible! Not at all. I myself nearly had the same idea. It was in my mind when I asked Mr. Wells that first question about the will. Then there were the bromide powders which she had made up, and her clever male impersonations, as Dorcas recounted them to us. There was really more evidence against her than anyone else. You are joking, Poirot. No. Shall I tell you what made Monsieur Lawrence turn so pale when he first entered his mother's room on the fatal night? It was because, whilst his mother lay there, obviously poisoned, he saw over your shoulder that the door into Mademoiselle Cynthia's room was unbolted. But he declared that he saw it bolted, I cried. Exactly, said Poirot dryly, and that was just what confirmed my suspicion that it was not. He was shielding Mademoiselle Cynthia. But why should he shield her? Because he is in love with her. I laughed. There, Poirot, you are quite wrong. I happen to know for a fact that far from being in love with her, he positively dislikes her. Who told you that, mon ami? Cynthia herself. La pauvre petite, and she was concerned? She said that she did not mind at all. Then she certainly did mind very much, remarked Poirot. They are like that, les femmes. What you say about Lawrence is a great surprise to me, I said. But why? It was most obvious. Did not Monsieur Lawrence make the sour face every time Mademoiselle Cynthia spoke and laughed with his brother? He had taken it into his long head that Mademoiselle Cynthia was in love with Monsieur John. When he entered his mother's room and saw her obviously poisoned, 
he jumped to the conclusion that Mademoiselle Cynthia knew something about the matter. He was nearly driven desperate. First, he crushed the coffee cup to powder under his feet, remembering that she had gone up with his mother the night before, and he determined that there should be no chance of testing its contents. Thenceforward, he strenuously and quite uselessly upheld the theory of death from natural causes. And what about the extra coffee cup? I was fairly certain that it was Mrs Cavendish who had hidden it, but I had to make sure. Monsieur Lawrence did not know at all what I meant, but on reflection, he came to the conclusion that if he could find an extra coffee cup anywhere, his lady love would be cleared of suspicion. And he was perfectly right. One thing more. What did Mrs Inglethorpe mean by her dying words? They were, of course, an accusation against her husband. Dear me, Poirot, I said with a sigh, I think you have explained everything. I am glad it has all ended so happily. Even John and his wife are reconciled. Thanks to me? How do you mean, thanks to you? My dear friend, do you not realise that it was simply and solely the trial which has brought them together again? That John Cavendish still loved his wife, I was convinced. Also, that she was equally in love with him. But they had drifted very far apart. It all arose from a misunderstanding. She married him without love. He knew it. He is a sensitive man in his way. He would not force himself upon her if she did not want him. And as he withdrew, her love awoke. But they are both unusually proud, and their pride held them inexorably apart. He drifted into an entanglement with Mrs. Rakes, and she deliberately cultivated the friendship of Dr. Bowerstein. Do you remember the day of John Cavendish's arrest, when you found me deliberating over a big decision? Yes, I quite understood your distress. Pardon me, mon ami but you did not understand it in the least. I was trying to decide whether or not I would clear John Cavendish at once. I could have cleared him, though it might have meant a failure to convict the real criminals. They were entirely in the dark as to my real attitude up to the very last moment, which partly accounts for my success. Do you mean that you could have saved John Cavendish from being brought to trial? Yes, my friend but I eventually decided in favour of a woman's happiness. Nothing but the great danger through which they have passed could have brought these two proud souls together again. I looked at Poirot in silent amazement, the colossal cheek of the little man, who on earth but Poirot would have thought of a trail for murder as a restorer of conjugal happiness. I perceive your thoughts, mon ami, said Poirot, smiling at me. No one but Hercule Poirot would have attempted such a thing, and you are wrong in condemning it. The happiness of one man and one woman is the greatest thing in all the world. His words took me back to earlier events. I remembered Mary as she lay white and exhausted on the sofa, listening, listening. There had come the sound of the bell below. She had started up. Poirot had opened the door, and meeting her agonised eyes, had nodded gently. Yes, madame, he said. I have brought him back to you. He had stood aside, and as I went out, I had seen the look in Mary's eyes, as John Cavendish had caught his wife in his arms. Perhaps you are right, Poirot, I said gently. Yes. It is the greatest thing in the world. Suddenly, there was a tap at the door, and Cynthia peeped in. I... I only... Come in, I said, springing up. She came in, but did not sit down. I... only wanted to tell you something. Yes? Cynthia fidgeted with a little tassel for some moments, then suddenly exclaiming, you dears, kissed first me and then Poirot and rushed out of the room again. What on earth does this mean? I asked, surprised. It was very nice to be kissed by Cynthia, 
but the publicity of the salute rather impaired the pleasure. It means that she has discovered Monsieur Laurence does not dislike her as much as she thought, replied Poirot philosophically. But, here he is! Laurence at that moment passed the door. Eh, hey, Monsieur Laurence, called Poirot, we must congratulate you, is it not so? Laurence blushed and then smiled awkwardly. A man in love is a sorry spectacle. Now Cynthia had looked charming. I sighed. What is it, mon ami? Nothing, I said sadly. They are two delightful women. And neither of them is for you, finished Poirot. Never mind, console yourself, my friend. We may hunt, together. Again, who knows? And then... The end.